Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of us on the West Coast. Thank you so much for joining our panel discussion today. We will get started in just one moment. For now, I would invite you to go into the chat and you can share uh, your name, you can share your pronouns if you like, and maybe let us know what city you're in. Let's see where everyone's located today. So my name is Carolyn. My pronouns are she, her. I'm with the Insurance Institute on the Career Connections team. And today I'm in the GTA and it's pretty sunny. So I'm not complaining about that. Alex, I think you're out in the East Coast. How is it there? Yes, I'm here in Nova Scotia. Um, it is actually quite sunny. We just had a lot of rain, which was great from the wildfires yeah. that we were just experiencing, but nice and sunny over here. And I see a lot of my team in the audience. So I just want to say hi to everybody. That's awesome. Great. And, and James, how about you? Where are you? So uh, I live in Vancouver, but I'm actually in Winnipeg today. And I okay. Weather here, it's, it's warm and muggy here in Toronto. When I left Vancouver yesterday, it was cold and rainy. It was about 14 degrees, about a 14 degree swing between the two cities. Wow. And what's your favorite? Weather, what's my not favorite? city. Oh. <laughs> Weather, not city. We won't ask that question. Don't worry. I mean, I, I, I prefer warm, warmth of any kind, even if it's muggy. Mm -hmm. I'm awesome. going to guarantee you that Winnipeg is not his favorite city. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason, Trevor, why I uh, why I fly into like I arrived at 1 30 in the morning this morning and it's down. So, yeah, you make the sacrifices you need to, right? Yeah. Hey, and Allison, yeah. how about you? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Allison Bullock. She, her, hers. I am in Edmonton, Alberta, where it is currently dreary, cool, and raining. Um, but we're happy to have it because we need uh, we need the rain. And uh, I just want to say, hey, Pan. Um, hi. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, have. A, hopefully, this goes really well. Mm, absolutely. So I can see in the chat here, we have some other people from Edmonton. We have Dartmouth, Toronto, Toronto. We have a crew from Intact, uh, Whitby. I thought I saw a Denver in here. Some more Edmonton. That's great. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining that's, today. Th that's me putting it out last minute. <laughs> that's good. We got to get that representation. Awesome. So we'll, we'll get started now. And just as we begin, I'd like to take a moment and begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all of the lands we are on today. While we're meeting today on a virtual platform, we want to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people who call this land home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their culture. Currently, we are hosting this meeting from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Please take a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we can, each in our own way, move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you. So now I would like to introduce Trevor Butram, he is the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of Career Educators and Employers, also known as Casey. And we're very lucky to have Trevor joining us today. He is going to be moderating our panel discussion. So thanks so much, Trevor. Please feel free to um, be active in the chat. You can use the chat function there, join in the conversation. We will wrap up at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, so we'll have an hour total. And uh, I'm going to, to pass it over to Trevor. 
Great. Thanks so much, Carolyn. And a thanks to, to you and the rest of the new entrance committee for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it is a bit of a homecoming. I've had the pleasure of spending uh, 11 plus years of my career uh, in the insurance industry at the Insurance Institute. And uh, to be a part of this conversation is really near and dear to my heart. So excited to uh, moderate the discussion. I do come to the conversation with a bit of a heavy heart in that the first quarter of 2023, according to an AGAL Canada report, that there have been 6,423 attacks on the 2SLGBTQ plus community across the country, with trans and racialized communities bearing the brunt of those attacks. However, it has never been more imperative that this prog the progress that we've made, the pride that we've shown, and the communities that we've forged not be undone, and that the commitments that the insurance industry has made are continued to be affirmed towards inclusion and belonging. As I mentioned, I'm honored to be a, a moderator of today's conversation, Power and Pride, unlocking the career potential of 2SLGBTQ plus insurance professionals. I invite all of you to let your pride shine and stand in solidarity with our insurance colleagues today and join me and the voices of experience that comprise today's panel as we create a braver space which empowers understandings of issues impacting 2SLGBTQ plus and industry professionals and their career paths, explore why representation and inclusion matter, especially now, and what individuals and organizations can do to foster a climate of belonging and support. I'd invite each of you now just to take a deep breath, settle into the conversation, and just be rest assured that our intention here is to create a braver space. I'd ask you now in the chat to share a word or short phrase or even an emoji that describes how you're coming today's, com today's conversation, whether that be hopeful, curious, nervous, prideful, wondering about, low energy, excited, whatever it is, share it with us in the chat so that we can understand where you're coming from and how you're joining us today. I'd also invite you to think about what brought you here today and what are you hoping to take away from today's conversation? Please put those thoughts in the chat as well and we'll do our best to hit on as many key takeaways as we uh, unfold and unpack several of the issues, emerging trends, challenges and opportunities faced by the sector as we look at uh, pride in insurance. So I am joined by an esteemed panel and I wanted to provide each of them with the opportunity to introduce themselves so that you can get to know them a little bit, the lens from which they're coming to the conversation, some insights into their own professional journey, their personal experience as supporting or as a member of the pride community, and a key takeaway that they hope that you come away with from today's conversation. So Alex, I'd like to start with you. Thank you, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. My heart is so full seeing all these faces in the audience today. Um, I'm coming to this conversation from the lens. I'm very kind of like Trevor said, I'm coming with a heavy heart. I think this conversation is definitely needed and I'm excited that everyone is here with an open heart ready to learn. Um, for my professional journey, I am currently with Intact Insurance as a personal lines underwriter. I've been in the insurance industry for three years. I started out as an agent with a direct writer, then a broker, and then I've moved on as an underwriter, which I've um, kind of found my, found my calling in the insurance industry. Um, my personal experience in the Pride community is right now at Intact, I currently lead a lot of regional and um, national diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, as well as our pride committee in the region, in the Atlantic region. And I also um, participate in a lot of community groups outside of work as well. And a key takeaway I'm hoping that everyone can leave with today is listening to everyone's story and letting that sit with them and think of how you can support the community going forward and demonstrate active allyship. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. James. Thanks, Trevor. Happy Pride, everyone. I'm uh, thrilled to be here. My name is James Bond. Uh, yes, my parents knew what they were doing. Um, 
I was named after an uncle who had a different last name as a bachelor coincidence, I'm not sure. Um, they thought uh, maybe it would last until I was about three or four years old, I think maybe one or two movies at the time. And, uh, of course, that's not what's happened. So it's often a question I get. I usually try to answer it up front. Uh, I'm the Senior Vice President, Chief Legal and Governance Officer of Wallace and Insurance, uh, where I'm lucky enough to serve as the Executive Sponsor of our Private Resource which covers our Canadian US operations. Um, I, I think my role in the panel maybe is, is, is the old guy. Um, I didn't come out until I was in my mid 20s and uh, starting law school, but I've uh, been fully out of my places of work for my entire career. So that's um, roughly around three decades now. Uh, my husband and I live in Toronto. I work in Winnipeg. Um, we have three children together with two moms who live in Toronto with the kids. Um, and I've benefited a great deal in my past from fantastic mentors and sponsors and general support from a number of people that have been around me uh, during that career progression. And I try to pay that forward whenever possible by mentoring others and supporting our community in any way that I can find that I can bring value to it. So when opportunities like this come up, I usually try to jump at them. And so I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks, Rob. Amazing. Thanks, James and Allison. Uh, my name is Bullock, Allison Bullock, seeing as James didn't do it, I'll do it. Um, I am an open transgender woman. Uh, I, um, I come from the lens. Uh, I am here today to um, hopefully show um, that trans people, um, because we're so vilified right now in the public space that we're, we're just normal people. Um, I think before I transitioned, I might have given James a run for his money for the old guy in the uh, room, but now I'll just be the old girl in the room. Uh, I started in insurance about six years ago. Prior to transition, I was a uh, sales rep, very forward facing, wasn't sure how I was going to be, how comfortable I was going to be in front of people. Um, so my partner at the time suggested that I look into insurance because of its early adoption for DE and I. Um, very good chance that I would be accepted. Started off in insurance pre-transition, transition during um, during my time there. Now I work for the Workers' Compensation Board, uh, which is the most amazing company um, that I can think of. Uh, my first job that Allison ever applied for, so I am one for one. Um, I uh, I just um, I just hope that people can just see that you know trans people we're just trans we're just we're just normal, but we're not. Um, we're just like you, but we're not, um, and we just want to live a, a really good life. And um, I can certainly say that my life post transition is is better than anything that I ever dreamt of. You know, you have those dreams, and I'm sure every queer person has had those dreams before they come out. Oh, I hope this. I hope that. I hope all of this. My life is way better. I couldn't have dreamed it to be this good. So I'm grateful for the industry. I'm grateful for my community. I'm grateful for the people who are close to me in life. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Amazing. And I want to thank each of you for your vulnerability and also your trust in the in the space that we're creating today to share a little bit about your personal story and and your own journeys in the insurance industry as well as a part of the pride community. I think it's so important that we engage in these dialogues, particularly now, but also at the same time recognizing and infusing a little bit of hope and reflecting about how far we've come where we're headed next and what opportunities lie ahead, I think both within the industry and also uh, beyond and, and the power of, of what pride can mean and represents. And so I wanted to get each of your perspectives on that. What does pride mean to you? And, and really, I guess, invite you to share why it's so important. Alex, let's start with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And pride means a lot of different things. And I think to everyone, it means something different. And initially in my journey, I did not feel a whole lot of pride in myself. I, that's why it is so important to me. But pride to me means being unapologetically myself, being proud to work 
being proud of the work I and my community have put in to take up the space and be heard. Um, pride also means bravery and standing firm and unwavering in the belief that everybody belongs no matter what their story is. And I think pride is so important because right now it is one of the most trying and dangerous times to be visibly queer. And yet I have never felt more pride as we come together as a whole to support one another and refuse to have our voices silenced. You know, you talk about the journey and, and I can empathize with sort of the feelings and wonderings and how how does one let pride show, particularly in in their personal and professional life if they don't necessarily feel it in themselves. And I'm really thrilled to hear from all of you about ways that you've come to a place of, of not only self-acceptance, but also creating pathways for others and inspiring others to see that it does get better um, and that there's opportunities as well, I think, um, for understanding and appreciation and, and through the storytelling and through the opportunities to kind of engage in thoughtful dialogue and conversation. Allison, how about for you? What does pride mean and why is it so important? Pride for me right now um, goes back to its origins. Pride is, um, it's a protest. Um, I'm not really celebrating Pride this year because um, of the vitriol that's just around, especially my, um, my letter in the community. Um, being trans right now is very dangerous. So um, what did I write here? I said, so for me, pride is simply this. Pride is a chance to connect with the community in a safer than normal environment. It's a place where we can congregate together, celebrate our successes, um, talk about our struggles, um, support those who need the support. Um, pride is also a chance to be defiant in the face of the transphobia, the homophobia, uh, the hate, um, and the fear that is um, sort of becoming a little bit more um, spoken uh, than it has been in the past. Um, it's a chance for those who are out there who are trying to erase us, it's a chance for us to say, mm -mm, ain't, ain't gonna happen. Uh, we're here. What is what is the old saying? We're here. We're queer. And we're not going. And James, you know this one better than I do. It's kind of a little bit before my time. Um, not my age, but you know, I, I only really came out like seven years ago, and only in public like three or four. So, um, and lastly, and most importantly, and this is the most important thing about Pride, it is showing the current generation and the next generation that it's okay that you are going to be okay. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your feelings. There's nothing wrong with how you wanna live life. And we are here, we will support you. We will lead you. Um, we will uh, protect you and we will stand beside you and uh, in front of you if need be. So to me, that's, that's what, and it really is. It's, I, I always say that my, my life is a pride celebration. I'm so stinking happy to be who I am. I'm such a better person than I was before. Um, but this month and this pride, this, this is a protest to me. A really powerful message, Allison, and it resonates in so many ways. And I can see in the chat so much love and so much sort of support coming through, not just for, um, you know, the, the, I guess, sentiment that voices won't be silenced, but that feeling of representation and that feeling of offering hope, not only to those currently, you know, a part of the community, but future, you know, and, and the next generation, and particularly the next generation of talent within the insurance industry. So thank you for that. James, I wanted to bring you into the conversation and get your perspectives on pride as well. Thanks. So I guess first, I'd just like to comment on uh, Alex's amazing capability. And I see this so much, especially with our brothers and sisters, um, capability to, to recognize the challenge and, and experience the challenges that are uh, the vitriol that's being directed at our trans community in particular. 
uh, and also still have a great sense of humor and be happy. So uh, that's that to me is <clears throat> amazing. Um, but you know, to the question, I guess really it's about three things for me. It's about celebration. It's about remembrance, and it's about that protest that I was talking about. You know, first and foremost for me, it's about you know celebrating and, and connecting with the members of the community, celebrating each other, celebrating what we've done, what we've achieved so far. Um, the second is about remembering the folks that came before us that actually put themselves and their livelihoods and their well-being at risk, their personal safety at risk, and on the line to fight for progress. Progress that some of us are, are now taking advantage of, and I, I, you know, I call it my privilege I'm, as a, um, a white gay male. I experience things much more differently than other members of our community do. Um, and then third, it's about that protest, you know, continuing to stand fast and fight for progress particularly in the face of the increased hate discrimination that's being targeted to certain members of our community. Uh, we need to remember where Pride started. It was born of protest, uh, and that fight for progress is really important. It's clear that our work isn't done yet. Uh, we still have a lot to do, and you know we're not all going to be free uh, until each one of us is free. So we need to keep that in mind. I think really Trevor, can I just, Trevor, yeah. can I just add to that? if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, thanks, James. Uh, I, I'd meant to mention uh, the, about the people who came before us, especially um, trans women of color um, and the work that they did all, all the way back um, to Stonewall to where it started. Um, they, they put their life on the line and um, for us to be where we're at. And I think it's absolutely criminal um that we're we're going backwards right now and to the point where we may have to put our lives on the line and i will i'm i'm currently I'm, I'm comfortable putting my life on the line and putting my job on the line to um to 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 lead uh the next generations forward and hopefully uh we, we won't have to do that and nobody else will have to do that ever again um and also thanks for the comment about the sense of humor this isn't water. That's how this works. I'm just kidding. It is water. I'm at work. So I don't want to get fired for that reason. I think, um, you know, often when we sort of have this opportunity to come together and to, to share these perspectives, what I take away so much is that that past, that history, but also the importance of of that next that next step and what that looks like, um, but Allison, to your to your point around uh, feeling of protection, you know, you do uh, having lived experience want to create and make it one step better, right? For anybody who is experiencing life as a part of the pride community in which whatever way that looks. Um, and I think just the fact that we can have this conversation in Canada, the fact that we are, um, you know, celebrating Pride Month is an incredible sort of evolution, at least for me, 18 year old me, I don't think would have thought that a whole month would have been dedicated to um, this kind of conversation. And I'm not sure that I would have thought that there would be so many who are standing in solidarity and standing up. Um, and are looking for ways to contribute to the conversation and looking for ways to to lend allyship. And I think knowing that that that's a part of the dialogue today is really heartening and and infuses a little bit of hope. And humor sometimes is the best medicine and the best combatant to hate. And uh, feel really excited that that's also been a part of our dialogue and a part of our conversation today. Um, James, sticking with you for a moment, I wanted to sort of explore, you know, and focus in on the insurance industry a little bit. What has Pride and Inclusion looked like um, within the PNC insurance industry for you from your perspective? You know, where has it been? Where is it going? And where does it need to go next? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I, you know, just a little bit of context for folks. I've really only been on this side of the equation, and I say this side of the equation, I used to practice law with a national law firm, so a national law firm for 10 years before seeing the light and, and joining uh, insurers um, about 10 years ago. Um, so it's been relatively recent, but even in that 10-year period, I can say that there have been significant strides that I, I think have been made in, your, in, uh, in the sector. And I think Allison's comment about you know 
the PNC industry, I think, having perhaps being a more welcoming environment um, for, for members of our community. I think that brings true. I, historically, I, I don't think there's any doubt that you know it was a you, know, you probably couldn't get more straight white male than uh, than our industry back in the day. And as a matter of fact, my CEO um, yes typically likes to show this picture of ironically of you know what the Wawad East Executive Committee looked like um, about 20 years ago, uh, and it was all very straight, very white, very male. Um, now our Executive Committee is half female, half male. I'm you know I'm a member of the of the executive committee and, and we've got some significant diversity in the ranks. And I think, so for diversity broadly, but for our community, I think specifically part of that is about the fact that our industry is all about looking after people in their time of need, right? Insurance proves its value when people really need it. And I think um, that when we're trying to develop um, products that speak to uh, our customer needs when we're handling claims, when we're handling any of their issues, there's an empathy there and a connectedness that I think that we try to drive just in terms of the way that we do business. And I think that really lends itself well to creating an environment that is more supportive of people, is more empathetic, um, and uh, and allows for kind of real, you know, concrete development in this space rather than the kind of performative to change my logo to the rainbow colors this month kind of approach so so i think you know without getting to, into too many into specific details although i will say you know our organization for example with our new building our new north american headquarters being built has um, all gender bathrooms um, as part of the, the structure we have um, a variety of different kind of concrete initiatives that we've undertaken to uh, to make spaces more welcoming for folks um, I just think that broadly speaking, we can harness that natural empathy that exists in our industry because of the work that we do. Um, I think uh, and we can go really far and uh, and avoid the kind of again the performative like you know not that I don't like to have a good Friday cocktail party. Don't get me wrong, but it's it's you know this this time of year and they have the uh, resources that our organizations can harness and put to uh, good use can uh, can be spent on things other than uh, cocktail parties and dare I say, uh, or it floats in Toronto. Yeah, I think that there's been a lot of evolution in the conversation, right? And there's also been a lot of evolution in the demographics. The recent demographic research, for example, out of the Insurance Institute of Canada shows that the industry is moving the needle significantly. Um, you know, in preparing for the conversation, I had the opportunity to review the report. It used to be sort of my operating sort of manual as well, the earlier studies in terms of how we would create programming and, and where areas of focus would be. One, industry is trending younger. So I think you're able to see, you know, shift. It's no longer sort of the 49% looming retirements we're seeing, or 27% looming retirements. We're seeing it more in the uh, 8%, which is actually exciting to, to see that there's been more balance, but also continued representation of women, and particularly in senior executive roles. Having opportunities to see people of color reflected across our industry, I think there was a 56% increase. The other place that I'm hopeful is that we'll be eventually see measurable change within the pride community as well. And I think that there's been infusion, but also creating the comfort and creating the spaces where people not just are, are proudly out at work, but feel like they belong at work, right? And I think that that's been a part of the critical conversation and the initiatives that you're talking about, James, are the steps that move beyond sort of love is love and love wins to a place of here's how we're going to create what belonging looks and feels like for you within our organization and some of the steps towards uh, towards real change. And I think that's happening across the board in a variety of ways, you know, with all demographics in the idea spectrum. But I think uh, particularly evidence, uh, you know, through some of the, the the work that we're seeing and the initiatives that you've referenced today. Um, I think it infuses a lot of hope and also demonstrates insurance as a community, you know, being there when we need it the most, also being there for our employees and for our people as they uh, navigate uh, whatever their life journey may look and, and, and feel like. And, and to Alex's, uh, to borrow Alex's language, to be unapologetically who they are. Um, Allison, I wanted to turn the conversation um, sort of to you as well to give opportunity and to give voice 
to why representation matters. And I think you've hinted at it. I think you've you've, you've done a really eloquent job of, of of talking about the ways that that particularly trans representation can have impact in terms of introducing and and creating a climate of understanding for folks. What why does representation matter? Where is it going to take us and and how can we continue to leverage the power of it? Thanks for giving me the easy question. Um, <clears throat> first of all, before this, I, I don't want to make this too much of a James Lovin. Um, I, I just wanted to say how much I uh, really liked what you said. And it made me think of something that um, insurance is kind of allegorical to queerness. Nobody really likes us until they need us or they get to know us. You know, there's there's so much disinformation and so much misunderstanding of what insurance does. Everybody's just like, oh, I just pay all this money and I don't get anything and da 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 da. And then the house burns down and everything is taken care of. Um, and I just it just it hit me right there that you know that's it's very much like us. Every there you know people who don't know us, um, they they're scared or they're confused or they're unsure about queer people, especially trans people, and then they get to know us and they realize that you know we're we're helpful, we're we're smart, we're funny, we're just normal people, and then all of a sudden they're like, hmm, why did I think so poorly of that sort of stuff? Um, and I can move that into your question. Um, representation is, I mean, it's more important now than it has been in many years. I can't say ever because of the of, of where it started, um, but certainly now more than ever, um, with the rhetoric vilifying trans people specifically, um, it's harder today than it was yesterday and tomorrow will be harder than it will be today. The vitriol is real, it's coordinated, it's well thought out um, and it has purpose. Um, and the only way to combat that is to be unapologetically, authentically ourselves and let the world see who we are, what we mean, um, and what we can do. Um, we're never going to change the minds of the far anti-trans movement. We can't. Representation is for the middle. It's for the common person. It's for the person who doesn't know doesn't know a trans person, doesn't know a gay person, doesn't know uh nb or non-binary person we need to be out there we need to lead we need to be seen we need to be heard um and we need to be um visible so that we can combat the lies the hate the fear um that is being sown uh by a group that's got um that's got an agenda um, so it's it's more important than ever. Um, I do think that it needs to be done in the right way, though, and I do think occasionally the queer community gets in its own way. Um, and we need to, you know, we need to we need to put our best foot forward. We need to we need to show the world that these these statements that are being made about us and I'm not going to repeat the words because I don't want to smash my computer up um, but um, I've I've been called them uh, and it's just it's just, just the only way is representation it's the only thing that we can do it's the only way that we can stem the tide is to be out there and just prove the lies wrong and the only way we do that is by being present, being authentic, um, and being seen. Yeah, I think you hit on so many wonderful points about, you know, if you have the opportunity to meet people where they are, and to be able to um, share, you know, again, authentically, who who is a part of the pride community, and particularly the trans community, in your examples, um, it's it opens the door for understanding and learning. 
I think so often we stand in positions of echo chambers of, you know, you're either with us or you're against us. And there isn't necessarily an, an in-between around that fosters the dialogue and the understanding. And also, I think that there's um, a lot of lumping in, in, our, in conversation, right? And so if you think about it, you know, why is it that an entire group is so concerned about like 1% of, of the overall population, you know, and so the dialogue is happening, you know, in places that's, where- that, That's a lot bigger conversation that we don't have time for it because in yes. reality, and we all know this, it's not about us. It's about control. Yeah. You know, if and they that, come after trans people um, because we're the easiest target, but they're not gonna stop with us. Then the next step is the gay people, the queer people. And then the next step is women's rights. And you know, like, and no, that's a, but that's a much bigger conversation that, uh, that is not for here. A hundred percent. And I think, I guess where I was headed was thinking about, you know, these, these issues can sometimes feel really overwhelming for folks, right? There can be a sense of they're bigger than me. They're not something that I can necessarily meet people where they are, or I can't learn about, or I can't necessarily move the needle. And I guess in idea-focused work, we hear about the importance of allyship and standing in solidarity with equity-deserving groups. And you know, I think sometimes the hesitation comes from feeling ill-equipped or like we may say or do the wrong thing or unsure about where even to start. So in an effort to release some of that, Alex, I wanted to ask you, what does standing in solidarity look and feel like for individuals and for organizations? Absolutely, and I think this is a really important question to talk about um, because it can be daunting. Sometimes you feel like at an individual level, what can I do? But at an individual level, solidarity comes in a lot of different forms. Something as simple as asking for pronouns, self-educating yourself to better understand marginalized groups is the very most important steps you can take. Um, also, willingness to grow from past mistakes, I think, is one of the most important things as well. People, when they're looking at standing in solidarity, they're scared to mess up. They're scared that they're going to say something wrong. It's impossible to fully know everything and be a perfect human being and never make a mistake. But as long as you're going into it with that open mind, with that willingness to learn, you're going to be okay. But you just have to be willing to grow and sit in that discomfort and have those difficult conversations. I think at an organizational level, it's a little bit more complex, but it's important that organizations are indeed walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Mm -hmm. Having rainbows during Pride, of course, is super important, changing your logos, being involved in the Pride parades, mm -hmm. but having policies that protect marginalized individuals and promote their inclusion within the organization are much mm -hmm. more important. It's important for organizations to not tokenize their employees as that can further drive mm -hmm. separation. Instead, they have to focus on integrating allyship into the day-to-day -day operations. Things like pronouns and emails, gender-neutral washrooms, and things as large as anti-discrimination training and leadership and implementing trans-inclusionary policies are a few examples of the many, that, many ways you can demonstrate allyship at an organizational level. But the key for individuals and for organizations to succeed in allyship and solidarity is to ensure that they're elevating the voices of the community rather than speaking for them. Focus on standing beside us rather than standing in front of us. All really, I think, important perspectives. And, you know, often I think organizations want to show support. There's also a feeling of we need to show support for all of our employees and all of our communities. And I think it's, um, you know, so it's easy to containerize into, you know, a month or a week or an awareness campaign. But I think it's so important that with all idea-based work that we're focused on this 365 days a year, right? That this is something that we're actively contributing to and making a part of our, our mindset. 
Um, I think the growth mindset, that healthy understanding of, of who we are and what we bring to the table, but also where our bias may be or where our experiences may, may be influencing our feeding misinformation or how do, how can we combat that and how do we put in the work, you know, and how do we, you know, I've, I've sort of come up with putting it into uh, what have you done today that moves the needle. Right, asking yourself. Trevor, can I share something? Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to share with the group, um, and maybe especially James, because this might be something he can look at. Yesterday, um, I got an email from our uh, health and wellness team. The Workers' Compensation Board here in Alberta has added to our health care plan gender affirming care, which includes. Um, facial feminization or facial masculinization, uh, liposuction, lipofilling, body contouring, um, and other um, gender affirming uh, care um, to a significant portion, $7,500 a year, $30,000 a lifetime. Uh, and that came from a DE&I um, focus group that was put out earlier this year. Um, also on top of that, they also added fertility and that sort of stuff, which is also great for a queer community, especially um, James. You know, I don't know if it was covered for you, but obviously um, having non-traditional babies can be quite expensive. Um, and our company has come out with that. And it's like it literally just came out yesterday. So I can't, um, this is how my company um, is standing up for uh, trans and, and the queer community. And they are working really hard um, to make it a 365 day a year thing. So I think it's just, um, I thought it was just absolutely amazing. I, yeah, yeah. sorry to jump in Trevor, but I, I think Ellison, that's fantastic. I, our kids are now, 11 and 13, so they 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 predate this. Our our exercise kind of predates me even uh, moving over into the insurance industry from from law. But uh, this is this is exactly the kind of thing that I was talking about when I was saying you know organizations need to focus less on the performative piece and more on the actual like listening to their stakeholders, including their employees, about what it is that they need, and then devoting their resources to that. And just to kind of go back to Trevor to your comments about you know. There's always this kind of what about is it? Well, what about this group? What about that group? What you know? I, and it's almost like that. Sometimes you'll see organizations or individuals say, "Well, I can't can't focus too much on this because what about the other equity seeking groups?" And my response usually is, "And all of the equity seeking groups, we we have to focus on all of them. You have to do the work for everyone. You have to recognize that one one does not negate the other. You can do it all. It's not a piece of pie." Um, so taking, you know, having a little bit for this person doesn't take any more away from the other people. Um, and at the end of the day, um, it's then at times like this, when we've got a particular time that we've all agreed is going to be a focus where we can talk about the work that we've done, the good work that organizations have done and how, you know, just like, just as we're doing in this panel. So I think you had said to your point or points earlier, 365 day year exercise, it's all about focusing on the wants and the needs of the folks in the equity equity seeking groups that are you're looking to help out and then being responsive to a hundred percent and I think you know when we can evidence and give examples um I think is super helpful and also Allison I I just wanted to to recognize that that's a huge step not only from a place of recognition and creating inclusion and belonging but also from a step of of investing in your talent right? Just if for, I guess, from my perspective, any time that you can demonstrate a commitment to your workforce that says we value and appreciate who you are, what your journey looks like, and how we can, how can we support you in that, um, I think always goes a long way. And I think um, it's, it's not just a fantastic thing to do from a human perspective and the right thing to do from an ethical perspective, but from a talent management and overarching securing the future of our industry perspective, I think it's it's imperative that organizations continue to move in this direction. 
I also wanted to highlight, you know, that with all idea-based work, you know, it's the amplification of voices, you know, as you said, Alex, you know, reading um, queer authors, being a part of um, Pride events, engaging in uh, contributions to charitable organizations, whether through time or money that are focused on Pride-based work, all of these are ways to be able to demonstrate solidarity and allyship as well. And it's coming up with your own list and what have you done, you know, taking that inventory to sort of move the needle towards inclusion and belonging, I think across the board is a healthy exercise for individuals and, and certainly for, um, for us just to kind of, I, I think, pause and reflect on, on ways that we can, we can evidence our, our standing in solidarity, both as individuals and organizations. Uh, moving into uh, sort of a, a conversation, or not necessarily to close, but to just make sure that you have opportunity to give this airtime, what do you most want our audience to understand or take away from this conversation? And James, I'll start with you. Sure. So, you know, I think... I think the theme is is here. I think, you know, we've had a, a few good years um, and I feel like over the last couple of years, um, you know, we're, we're starting to see some real challenges. Not that they didn't exist before, they always did, but we're seeing more and more um, how um, thoughts are being weaponized and uh, fake news is being weaponized um, against our communities. And I, I guess, we all just need to keep in mind that we're all in this together. We're not finished the fight for equality until all of the members of the LGBTQ plus community can probably live their authentic lives and without fear and be treated with dignity and respect. And I feel like, you know, the groups that are represented by the individual letters are, we're not monolithic even within those letters, but just like broad social diversity um, is a source of strength. I think diversity within our own community is a source of strength. And in particular, those of us of privilege, those of us who maybe have made it a, a few steps further up the ladder need to turn around now and extend our hand and, and help the others up as well. That's that's what I'm hoping we get this. Yeah, I think um, this is not a, a destination, it's a journey, right? And it's somewhere, it's something that we need to keep sort of in check, um, that we need to keep vigilant of, that we need to continue the dialogue on and ensure that it's a part of of our our broader sort of conversations um, within the idea space. Um, Alex, how about for you? What do you hope folks are taking away from today? Um, I think just to build off of James's point, um, we're all in this together. An attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. And I think now is the most important time that us as a community and allies stand together. This is when we need us the most. And I think an important thing I would like everyone to take away is everyone here on the panel has different backgrounds. We all have very different lives. But something to remember is that we're all seeking the same thing. We're all seeking love, acceptance, and safety. We all have very different stories, but want the same thing in the end. And I think that's what's most important to take away from this. A, a great way to, to look at it and to frame it in that, you know, we're, uh, each of us is diverse and unique in our own story, but ultimately we want the same things. And I think that that's also the perspective across the landscape in general, right? Is that if we can offer, you know, that that love, acceptance and safety to as many folks as we possibly can. And I think that's how we continue to drive this forward. Allison, what do you hope that folks are walking away with today? Um, to continue my love in with James, um, thank you so much. You you are right. Um, those of us with um, privilege, um, and I consider myself to be privileged. Um, I'm I'm very lucky. I am a homeowner. I have a professional job. I'm financially secure. Not that I wouldn't take a you know junior vice president job at Wawanisa or something like that if it was offered, because we do need more queer representation in the boardroom. Um, but, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, LGB without the T that we're seeing now. Um, and Alex, thank you. James, thank you. Um, you know, 
we do have to stand together. Um, something that you said, Trevor, um, it's not the destination, it's the journey. It's neither of those things. It's a war. I'm sorry to make it turn dark or anything like that, but we're in a war. And right now, the anti-queer, anti-LGBTQ uh, movement, um, they're on the counteroffensive. We've been, we've been making ground, right? We've been moving the line um, and they're pushing back and this is their hardest and hopefully last pushback because the next generation and the generation after that, they have no chance. We just have to stay the line, move it forward and they'll take us home. So the point that I want um, people to leave with here today is, you know, if you're queer, we, we need to stand together because an attack, as Alex said, an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. If you're an ally, you can no longer sit quiet. You can no longer support us in private or in small groups. Trans kids specifically are gonna suffer. Just came out today that the Catholic School Board in Calgary um, is uh, making it um, like, I don't know, it's you, you now have to, you can't, teachers can't call kids by their preferred names. It has to go to their parents. Um, and we all know about New Brunswick. Um, they're going to suffer if we don't stand up and speak up. We can no longer just shake our heads and put our heads down and be like, ah, oh, weird Uncle Jake. If we don't speak up now, we lose ground. And yes, it might be uncomfortable, but if you are an ally, if you hear your friends, you hear your neighbors, you hear your family members saying things or repeating rhetoric, you have to stand up now. You can no longer stay quiet. You can no longer just wear a rainbow patch to be an ally. We have to speak. And dance gaily. <laughs> and I think the the sentiment that we need to speak, that we need to stand up, that we need to be together in this. We need to risk. Yeah. Yeah. I I I agree and and hear that sentiment. Um, and I think the other piece for me, you know, the challenge that you've issued to allies and those that say that they stand in solidarity is to evidence it, to show it, to give us the opportunity to uh, to amplify and to give um, even louder voice uh, to, to those that need to be heard and to be represented and to be supported right now. Um, you know, I early in my career was focused on education and remember sort of the the feelings of vulnerability and exposure that I felt in the classroom and remember being told at various points in my career that I was unfit to teach children and simply because of who I was. And so I can only imagine what it looks and feels like for children to feel like that they are unfit to be a part of a community because of who they are. And so I think it's so important that when these issues are are raised, that we confront them, and that we raise up, rise up, and that we challenge those that rhetoric each and every day, um, and to, as you say, Allison, put it on the line in terms of uh, making sure that we don't go backwards, but continue moving forwards. When we have the conversation, I think today as well, you know, I wanted to just open the floor to questions and to any dialogue from those who are. Um, joining us on the line. Uh, certainly, if you want to put that in the chat or if you wanted to raise a hand, I'll request that my Insurance Institute colleagues uh, just flag anything that comes in. Uh, but I also wanted to close with a little bit of a rapid fire and then turn things over you, to you for final thoughts. Um, so that rapid fire looks a little bit like this. So I'm going to ask a question and each of you just in, in one word, if you want to put a link in the chat, you can also do that or a short phrase uh, for each of these questions. So um, going across the line, starting with James, uh, Pride Focused Charity of Choice. 
Sorry, about putting it in the chat or am I responding in person? If you can respond and also put oh, a link in the chat if you like. Sure. So I'm on the board of an organization called the Dr. Peter Raines Foundation, and I uh, spent a lot of time supporting them. So that's, that's the one, and I'll put a link into the chat. That's great, Alex. The Youth Project of Nova Scotia, it is a local charity, but they have a lot of national initiatives and resources as well. So I'll put that in the chat. Awesome. Allison? PFLAG. Um, I work as a, a counselor for uh, trans youths, uh, but for me, uh, my focus is more on parents of trans uh, kids who are struggling with acceptance and understanding. Um, so I, I will also put that in the um, in in the chat because um, I think it's 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 super uh, super important. Fantastic. And I think when we talk about charities of choice, what I love is that there's that broad range of those that may be local and those that have national or international significance. Consider sort of supporting all of those and amplifying them. Uh, your favorite thing about summer, James, back to you. Uh, pride <laughs> and being outside, but pride is my favorite thing. That's Fantastic. Alex? Um, my Pride as well. I'm looking forward to support some of the smaller um, charities and organizations that are doing Pride events this year. Nice, amazing. Allison? Uh, the World Series of Poker. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. It's Pride and tan lines. <laughs> there you go. I waited a long time to have tan lines. <laughs> amazing. Um, best piece of career advice you've ever received? James? What got you here isn't going to get you there. Ooh, I like that. Alex? Failing is nothing to be ashamed of. It just prepares you for the next time you try. Allison? Oh, I can't beat either one of those, so I'm just going to go comedy. Uh, don't sit. Uh, don't, what is it? Don't uh, stand when you can sit. Don't uh, sit when you can lie down. And don't ever play cards with a man named Doc. <laughs> there you go. Um, right now, too, in particular, I think focus on self-care is so important so that we can continue the fight. What's your go-to restorative activity, James? Spending time with my husband. Uh, he doesn't ground me. He lifts me up. He, I am grounded enough, but he uh, keeps me with my, my life light, and that's uh, often what I need. So that would be my favorite restorative activity. Alex, how about for you? Um, my favorite restorative activity, honestly, is a long walk listening to the burlesque soundtrack with Sharon Christina Aguilera, <laughs> favorite movie in the whole world. <laughs> there you go. And Allison? Um, wow. Um, sports, athletics, um, working out, Krav Maga, uh, just moving my body in a meaningful way. Clara Hughes tells us that movement is medicine, and I, I firmly believe that as well. And thank you for sharing those. I also wanted to give you an opportunity to recommend a Pride resource. Um, you can put the link in the chat after you've shared it. So, so James, what's what's your go-to? Yeah, so this is a new one. Uh, some folks may already be aware of it, uh, but I, you know, it's it's an organization that's focused on. Um, opportunities for members of our community in the insurance sector is called um, the link insurance network so uh, i'm going to send a link to that to, in the chat and uh, getting a lot of traction relatively new but getting a lot of traction and uh, very toronto focus right now but um we'll, we'll let that go and um, I encourage you all to, to check it out alex how about for you Mine is actually the same as before as the Youth Project, but they do offer um, a lot of career counseling as well um, for individuals, especially youth entering the workforce as well. So that would be the same link that I had sent before. Nice. And Allison? Uh, obviously, um, for me, PFLAG is such a big one, um, but also uh, the Trevor Project yeah. um, and EGAL. Um, you know, obviously that's a sports and uh, athletics focused um, charity. So, um, but for <laughs> national, I think uh, the Trevor Project's a pretty good, um, a pretty good one for people to look into. Yeah, there are so many fantastic resources out there, toolkits, um, and, you know, also just even 
I love resources that cause you to reflect and to think on your own experiences and to, to sort of benchmark a little bit about where you are and where you're going and and also to to share unique stories and perspectives. Um, I'd encourage folks to check out um, Rainbow Railroad as well, um, you know, as a resource in terms of understanding that right now there are still countries in the world that uh, make being who you are illegal um, and uh, punishable by death. Um, although the the work in Canada still has lots still to be done. Uh, I am thankful to live in a place where I have some legislative protection and uh, also some support um, from uh, those around us in, in terms of, of moving the needle um, and would invite us to, to continue to preserve that and to continue to fight for that. Um, in drawing this conversation to a close, I wanted to offer each of you an opportunity as well, just for a final thought or final piece of reflection, recognizing that we're at time, I'll give you about 30 seconds to offer that. So Allison, we'll start with you. Uh, I just wanna thank you for, uh, for putting this on and for the Institute itself for understanding that this needs to be talked about. Um, I hope it can become a, a, a yearly thing um, and that we can promote this better so that we can um, reach a larger audience. So thank you guys so much, James. Alex, thank you so much for, uh, for being a part of it and speaking your truth um, and speaking up. Thanks. Amazing. Thanks, Allison. I agree. I hope that the dialogue continues and becomes uh, a part of our, our annual offerings. Alex? Um, I want to say thank you to both James and Allison and you, Trevor, for participating in this panel with me. Um, Allison, you shared some really great insight and some really touching stories, so I do really appreciate your view on this panel. I want to thank each and every one of you in the um, audience today for joining us, and I really hope to see more faces next year. Alex, thank you for bringing your perspective to the conversation. Uh, it is uh, so appreciated as well. And um, I think it offers a lot of hope, uh, particularly seeing you as an emerging industry professional and continuing uh, this work in this story. James. I couldn't have said anything better than Allison and Alex have already. So just thanks to everyone. And uh, I love being in a position where I get to learn something new every day. And make new connections. And so thanks for giving me that opportunity as well. Fantastic. On behalf of the Insurance Institute of Canada, it's been my pleasure to moderate this conversation with James, Alex, and Allison. Uh, thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, your expertise, uh, and for inspiring us, I think, uh, during a time where it feels pretty dark for being a voice of light, uh, for being a voice of, of pride, uh, and for also being a voice of what we need to continue to do uh, to move us forward, not only as an industry, but also as a society. Thanks for the conversation, everyone. A huge thanks for being here today and look forward to continuing the dialogue 365 days a year. Have a great one, everybody. <laughs>